All right, hi Founder fans, Jason here. Welcome to Founder of the Day. We are starting our week in review as we do every week where I will be discussing the last seven founders of the day that I published on my website, founderoftheday.com. I see a lot of people making comments already this week, which is a little unique because usually there's not a lot of comments on this video, but that's okay. Maybe because it's Thanksgiving tomorrow, everyone's all excited and uh, to be here learning about the American Revolution. Although I should note, happy Thanksgiving, everyone. I hope you and your families have a great time. So I am going to pull up here the uh, articles that we'll be discussing. And again, as I said, for those of you new here, we're talking about the last seven founders of the day. And I do want to note real quick, we do have trivia on Fridays, and I am still going to be doing trivia this Friday, as we do every Friday, even though it's a holiday weekend. And for those of you who missed last week, we have changed the scoring back to the original version, where uh, everyone who answers correctly gets a point now. So it's more fair, and I don't have to be such a bad guy. Anyway. Let's go and take a look at some of these American founders. We're going to start out with Uriah Tracy. Now, Uriah Tracy is a very interesting character. <clears throat> Excuse me. Uh, Tracy was from Connecticut, and he did fight early in the American Revolution as a very young man, not yet 20 years old. However, Tracy decided, oh, okay, I'm going to go to school. And he does go to school, and he gets a degree at Yale, and then he enters Connecticut politics, and he makes his way up the chain pretty quickly uh, through politics to becoming attorney general before he even turns 30 years old. He's attorney general of the state of Connecticut. Additionally, during this time, he stays in the Connecticut militia and ends up becoming a major general. But he really makes a name for himself in 1793 when he is sent to the uh, United States House of Representatives on behalf of Connecticut. And he stays there for several years, becoming a leader in uh, as a Federalist, a member of the Federalist Party. He becomes a leader uh, for Connecticut. I'm sorry, got a little distracted by some comments. I'm glad you can make it, TJ. Thank you so much. And yes, John Adams is great, everyone. <laughs> anyway, um, any hoozle. Uh, Uriah Tracy uh, is a leader in Connecticut. He gets sent to the House of Representatives and becomes a leader of the Federalist Party. And eventually, he actually becomes a leader of the United States Senate. And during this time, Alexander Hamilton leaves and goes back to New York City because Congress has moved to first Philadelphia and then Washington. Hamilton leaves, and although Hamilton is always kind of the default leader of the Federalist Party, and John Adams as a Federalist president was technically the leader of the Federalist Party, Uriah Tracy, by the time he moves up to the United States Senate, essentially is the leader of the Federalist Party during the John Adams administration, which is in a very important time. It's really when the Federalist Party was at its most powerful before it starts to fade away once the Democratic Republicans take control. Additionally, Tracy for six months becomes president pro temper of the United States Senate for six months in the year 1800. And this essentially makes him the third most powerful lawmaker in the United States. During this time, there are a few impeachment trials and Tracy, more or less, he heads the committee that decides the rules of impeachment. And we still to this day when the Senate, the rare occasion that the Senate does have an impeachment trial, well, guess what? They primarily follow Tracy's rules that he wrote seemingly a very long time ago. Either way, uh, unfortunately, Tracy passes away in the year 1807. Uh, still pretty young. Still, He's in his late 40s at this point. But he's interestingly buried in the Congressional Cemetery. And he's actually the first United States senator buried in the Congressional Cemetery in Washington, D.C., now, now a lot of people are buried in, and I do want to note, first senator, not first congressperson, um, but first senator buried there. And here's where I have to acknowledge that I made a little bit of a mistake. I accidentally published this article before another article that I wanted to publish first. I did publish that article this week, and we are going to talk about this, but I just want to note that when later on we're talking about James Monroe and George Washington, uh, uh, Uriah Tracy wrote under the pen name Signature of Scorpio, he wrote a defense. It's called Reflection... Reflection... Well, easy for me to say. Reflections on Monroe's view of the conduct of the executive. And essentially, he writes 
uh, a defense of George Washington's foreign policy during his administration, specifically regarding the Jay Treaty, which famously not a lot of people cared for. <laughs> um, uh, that being said, for a very long time, this was considered to have been written by Alexander Hamilton, but evidence has come out over the last several decades that, no, it was actually this gentleman, Uriah Tracy. And again, we are going to get further into that conversation uh, in a few minutes when we get to Monday's article that it was supposed to be published first and I was just absent-minded and, and did a matter of order. So sorry about that. Uh, I will remind you of this minute, minute six, <laughs> when we get there. Uh, but that's essentially Uriah Tracy. Again, one of the heads of the Federalist Party uh, during the John Adams administration, a, 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 an extremely important player in uh, the government during the quasi-war with France. After this, we're going to go to last Friday, where, as you know, if you've ever been here before, uh, Fridays, I used to write a Federalist, uh, I used to write about a Federalist paper every Friday, now I write about anti-Federalist papers on Friday, and this week we do another, uh, someone whose pen name we know, but whose actual identity we are not aware of, they published under the name Alfred, which, I, I don't know, I feel like that's a little silly, <laughs> personally, um, uh, interestingly, reading back in the late 1800s, I don't come into the name Alfred ever. I don't remember ever hearing of an Alfred, but clearly it was a name that was around because this person decided that would be their pseudonym. It was published on Christmas Day, 1787, and Alfred, Alfred published an article titled Europeans Admire and Federalists Decry the Present System. Now, as I said, this is an anti-Federalist author writing, uh, and, and he's speaking very specifically about the present system. And what's interesting, Braden, is uh, kind of like Batman's Alfred. He talks about John Adams. Now, he doesn't name John Adams very specifically, but he does reference something John Adams wrote. we got to take a side note right now. We always for, don't forget that John Adams was an author. You know, as I mentioned, I think two weeks ago, John Adams had published under the name uh, Humphrey Plow Jogger. Uh, back in the 1760s, he was printing uh, anti-taxation information about the government. And he would write, and now we, here we are, 25 years later in the late 1780s, and just as the Philadelphia Convention is meeting and they are starting to write the, uh, the, the United States Constitution, John Adams is serving as minister to Great Britain over in Great Britain. And he publishes a three-volume book while he's in Great Britain. And Adams's work is, is titled, A Defense of the Constitutions of Government of the United States of America. Now, John Adams didn't realize they were over there at the same time writing a constitution for the United States of America, but he wrote in defense of the several constitutions of the several states of the United States of America, um, who at the time primarily viewed themselves as independent countries, I will remind you. So, but what Adams writes is he's defending these constitutions that he had a large part in writing several of them. His thoughts on government in 1776 was profoundly influential on building many of the individual state governments. John Adams' uh, influence on the, the idea of government in the United States is deep. It's not just... Massachusetts. It's many of the state governments, which in, in turn, and including this book he just wrote, was read by and affected the people who wrote the United States Constitution. So even though Adams himself was absent from the Constitutional Convention, his presence loomed large. It's one of the many, many reasons that he came back from Europe after a decade away from North America and walked right into the vice presidential chair. He was so well respected on his on his knowledge of government, and a huge part of that is his writings. So anyway, he writes this uh, defense of the constitutions of the United States, and it's really well received in Europe. And this is the height of the Enlightenment. This is kind of the, the climax of the Enlightenment, just as the Industrial Age is taking over from the era, Age of Enlightenment. And even though many of these places have monarchies still, uh, they like the idea of republicanism. Most of them are constitutional monarchies, which are 
close enough to republicanism, and he references many of the his contemporary republics, including um, the Netherlands was a republic, uh, uh, principalities, uh, uh, Switzerland was a republic, although France kind of oversaw its independence, um, uh, and you know certain principalities and papal in the papal states, which we would know today as Italy. These were republics, and he referenced all of them and kind of proved why the United States ones were better. And people loved it. And I bring it up here because Alfred, in his Anti-Federalist paper, publishes, look, I mean, the title of his paper is Europeans Admire and Federalists Decry the Present System. And he said Europeans Admire it is in the title because he what John Adams wrote and how well they received John Adams's defense of these constitutions. He's like, look, they're fawning over this. Europe wants what we have. They're jealous of us. Why would we change it? And then he goes on, Alfred that is, goes on to discuss the two main problems. And I, I will read you a quote from the end of his, his paper here. Uh, the two main problems he sees in the, um, the current system, aka uh, the system under the Articles of Confederation. He says, quote, public virtue and the want of money are two of the principal sources of our grievances. So let's break that down. I'm going to start with the second part first because he does dive in further into that. The want of money. What he basically says, all right, thanks for showing up, Braden. I appreciate it. I understand it's late. Um, the want of money, what Alfred says is, look, we have, we're making all this wheat and all these products, all this tobacco that we're putting on boats and shipping to Europe, and they're sending us money. Things are great here. And he, in a way, he echoes some of the earlier Anti-Federalist papers we talked about, where, where it was like, uh, 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 last week, uh, the name is eluding me, but we, we literally asked the question, how is your life? How bad is it for you as an individual in under the Articles of Confederation? For most people, it was... Pretty, I, I shouldn't say most people. Obviously, slavery was a problem at the time. But uh, for most people who would have been reading that paper, things were okay. And he says, the echo is basically the same thing. Our lives are good. We have all this money coming in. Now, uh, we keep sending our money out because the wealthy seem to want to buy all this fancy European crap, for lack of a better term. Uh, and they're sending, you know, we're buying all this very expensive European stuff. We could make this at home. Uh, and he very specifically says... We need to be more frugal. You want to raise money for the federal government or, or under the Articles of Confederation? We can. But we, first of all, need to be more frugal. And second of all, we need better public virtue, as he says. Now, the word virtue at the time meant something different than we think of it today. Generally, when we think of virtue today, it's like, be a good person and you are virtuous. Uh, I know that's a, a, a gross estimation. You know, that's a... a, a narrowing down of the actual definition of virtue, but in essence, that's what we think of virtue. For them, at the time, virtue was, if you have the means and opportunity to help the public, uh, then you have to. It's your duty as a citizen. Go help the public. Um, and be virtuous while you do it. And Alfred here was under the impression that many of the public figures were not necessarily in it for to be virtuous. And in fact, the reason that they were having so much trouble raising money is those public figures who were supposed to be leading the, the, in the separate states, they were also supposed to be finding ways to get money to the Articles of Confederation, to the Continental Congress, to help pay off some of the international things that they needed to pay off. And unfortunately, in Alfred's estimation, well, it's these same people who are not taking care of the financial difficulties that the separate states find themselves in that are the ones who wrote this constitution and now want to raise all this money and be in charge. How about, instead of giving these people more power, we get some other people in there who can be a little bit more frugal and better with our finances? So that is the anonymous author Alfred's take, um, and I found it absolutely fascinating, especially how he was referencing jo John Adams. A and it's super, it's super interesting to me how John Adams can be 
a thousand miles away on the other side of an ocean and still affecting the everyday conversation back in the United States at a time where like, you know, there was no YouTube. <laughs> you weren't just going to see a video of him. It was literally the power of his pen. So let's move on now to our next subject. Uh, of course, over the weekends, as I'm sure uh, many of you know, but anyone new here, uh, over the weekends, I'm lazy and don't write new articles. I publish uh, from my extensive archives. Uh, I republish some old articles. And this weekend, I, re I reposted two articles uh, about brothers, siblings, Isaac and Nicholas Lowe. And their stories are very interesting. And we'll start with Isaac Lowe because he was much more important to the American Revolution. So... Come 1774, Parliament passes the Port Act, and the Port Act is what closed Boston off. And essentially, you know, things had already been a little bit rebellious by this point, but the Port Act closes off Boston and says, no, 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 you are now under military dictatorship under Governor Thomas Gage. You may not do anything at all. We're going to set curfews. It's going to be terrible if you live in Boston. And... It was, and the people of Boston were obviously unhappy, but many other colonies were unhappy because many other colonies were already unhappy at what was going on. Most of them were kind of like, I mean, New York, uh, you know, Boston, cool it a little bit. Don't stir up so much. Stop shaking the pot or mixing the can. What? What is it? <laughs> Stop causing so much trouble, Boston. We understand why you're complaining and we're with you on this, but slow your roll. That didn't happen. And then the Port Act happens. And suddenly these other other colonies are like, whoa, Parliament. You know, we're unhappy with what you're doing. We don't like it, but this is a little much. And this is especially notable in a certain place called New York City. Now, New York City was not then what it is now. It was not, uh, you know, uh, Philly and then Boston were the biggest cities. I don't even think New York was the third biggest city. I I'm not exactly what, sure what, po what the population was at the time. Uh, in 1774, it was the biggest by 1800. <laughs> um, but New York was an, it was an important port, and they were like, what is this? Whoa, 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 whoa. We're locking down ports all of a sudden? And New York, which was already a little bit more behind Boston than most other colonies, um, especially New York City, which is interesting because it becomes very loyalist very quickly, um, but it did have a lot of gangs for lack of a better term, acting up. Um, and New York gets furious at this. And they call a meeting at France's Tavern. And the chairman of this meeting in 1774 is a gentleman named Isaac Lowe. Now, Isaac Lowe comes from a wealthy family. Uh, he mostly grew up in New Jersey, but a wealthy family who owned land in New York and New Jersey. He uh, inherited his father's merchant house and was making a filthy living. And he also owned a ton of real estate. And was, and was a renter and made rental income. Great gig if you can get it. Had a lot of money coming in. Uh, and Lowe is not happy that his merchant business has been suffering. Uh, and apparently could just be shut down whenever the government felt like it. And I will also note that by this point, Lowe had already been a chairman of New York City's Committee of Correspondence. And of course, the committee of, committees of correspondence were put together in a town-by-town, city-by-city level to communicate with the other towns and cities about the goings-ons of what Great Britain was doing. So the, this meeting at Francis Tavern happens, and they decide the next day to post a note that says, everyone, come to the middle of town. We're going to have a big public meeting, and you're going to vote for representatives. And they do, and they people come in, and they all vote for representatives, and 51 people are chosen. And this becomes the Committee of 51. And the chairman of the Committee of 51, the first, essentially, revolutionary government in New York, the chairman was Isaac Lowe. He, at this point, was the head of rebellious sentiment against the crown. Now, there was still a colonial assembly and a royal governor over here. And over here, they have the Committee of 51 and its chairman... Isaac Lowe. Now, eventually the Committee of 51 would become the government. Once independence happens, uh, it would change names several times. It would uh, They'd have another election a little bit while later, become the Committee of 60, uh, another election after that, Committee of 100, and then it would change to the, the New York Provincial Congress, uh, or Provincial Assembly, I'm sorry. 
Uh, and that would happen after independence. But this is the infancy of the shadow government that would eventually take over New York State, uh, New York State, yeah, on behalf of the rebels. And the person in charge of this is Isaac Lowe. So during this time, the First Continental Congress is called together, largely in response to the Port Act. Because now, finally, other cities and states are saying, okay, 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 yeah, yeah. We, need to, we need to do something about this. And they think back to just nine years beforehand when they had the Stamp Act Congress in New York City that sent some grievances back to the king and they were resolved and the Stamp Act was repealed. And they said, okay, we'll just do that again. <laughs> and uh, we know now that it didn't work out quite the same way. But they go and one of the delegates sent to represent New York at the First Continental Congress is Isaac Lowe. And while at the First Continental Congress, he signs the Continental Association, which was the boycott, uh, among other things, the boycott of British goods until grievances were resolved. And they also sent some letters to Parliament and the King and said, you know, stop it. <laughs> um, and then they went home. And when they went home, as I said, the Committee of 51 has another election, becomes a Committee of 60. And again, the chairman is... Isaac Lowe. He is the head. He is the representative of rebelliousness against the crown in New York State. And then a few months later, Lexington and Concord happens. Now, by the time Lexington and Concord happens, uh, Isaac Lowe helped raise a New York militia and fortify defenses of New York City in case war broke out. And then war breaks out. And apparently Lowe had started saying you know, tried to be a voice of reason. You know, wh one of the reasons he was elected as chairman so many times is he was, uh, how do you say, um, cool and confident. He, he was reflective. He wouldn't just make snap decisions. He would reason things out. And he started reasoning out, maybe we don't start a war quite yet uh, for several reasons. Again, uh, when Lexington and Concord broke out, very few people actually promoted independence. Very, very, very few. Most people were like, this hair is just killing me. I'm sorry. Anyway, most people were like, no, we want to be loyal subjects of the crown. We just want the crown to give us our rights. And after the war broke out, well... Lowe, Isaac Lowe starts fading back and he's eventually replaced not long after the war starts with someone more radical because once the war actually starts then you have more and more people saying okay 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 maybe we throw up the crown maybe independence is an option and as people start saying that more and more Lowe says it less and less and becomes much more resistant to leaving the greatest empire in the history of the world as far as he saw it at the time and most people saw it at the time even the most ardent rebels would admit, yes, Great Britain is the most powerful empire in the world. And then a year goes by and he fades out of this slowly in the first year of the war. Isaac Lowe fades from being the leader of New York's rebellion to being in the background and eventually decides enough is enough. I'm not going to revolt against the crown. And he turns around and becomes a loyalist. Now, shocking as that may be, and heartbreaking as that may be, uh, he ends up leaving New York and going, trying to go back to New Jersey. And on his way to New Jersey, he's actually arrested by a New Jersey militia. And he is officially ordered by George Washington to be released because of how important he was to bringing New York State to the revolutionary cause. He would go back to New York City uh, and then stay there through the war, and then after, unfortunately for him, the British lost the war, uh, he ends up leaving as a refugee, and never returns to the land he had spent his entire life in up to that point, which is a fairly common refrain for many loyalists. So now we're going to move on from Isaac Lowe, who was an important patriot leader, and then a loyalist, to his brother Nicholas Lowe, who was kind of neither. So Nicholas Lowe grew up in the same environment in New Jersey and then also became a member of one of the biggest merchant firms in New York City. 
and he also owns some real estate. And he becomes one of the most prominent men in New York City. But when the revolution begins, while his brother Isaac is out there making a big stink, Nick is not. He's kind of keeping to himself. Uh, he doesn't really consider himself a politician, uh, nor is he that outraged about what's going on. But he's certainly not happy with what's going on. Obviously, it's not great for him as a merchant. But he kind of stays out of it throughout the whole war. And he, I usually reference him uh, a, a, a certain section. There's a group I call the Forgotten Third. And we need to remember that when the war was going on, about a third of the people were patriots and supported the rebels. Another third supported Great Britain and were loyalists and didn't like an insurrection. And then another third, an entire third of the people living in the United States at the time of the war, the colonies living in British North America, didn't care. They just tried to stay out of it. Now, these people were usually victims uh, of raiding parties, look at, not like murder victims from the war, like people would come raid and take their food and stuff, um, especially in the New Jersey area during the Forge Wars and outside New York City in general. But uh, Nicholas was very wealthy, so he didn't suffer from that. He stayed in New York City while the British were there, and then the British left, and he stayed in New York City. And no one cared because he didn't take sides. He was just there living their lives. Cities don't just shut down during the war. People need to still operate them. And that's kind of what Nicholas Lowe did. And what's very interesting is when the British evacuated and people like his brother left, uh, all the loyalists went out and many patriots came back. But there was a giant... New York had this weird fluctuation in leadership where many loyalists, many people in New York City were under loyalist supervision, the direct supervision of the British Army for eight years. And then suddenly, gone. And now these patriots come back in and they're like, hey, we weren't around, we threw off that government that you were accustomed to for a very long time. So the people of New York City, they turned to people that they knew they could trust. And one of those people was Isaac Lowe, who had just simply stayed out of it, tried not to be a politician for a very long time, just wanted to run his business, help out the city where he could, and they turned to him to be a leader. And it's kind of thrust upon him, and he does a fairly good job. Now, he doesn't take over many major issues, but he does serve in the state assembly for a while. And he also serves uh, in the New York State Ratification Convention when the Constitution was presented to New York, and it was a very uh, close call in New York, was the swingiest of swing states. That's why the Federalist Papers were written in New York quote, to the people of New York, because they really wanted to get New York involved, uh, on board. And Isaac Lowe was chosen to go to that convention, and he actually f supported and voted for the United States Constitution. Interestingly, where, where uh, Nicholas Lowe really becomes a founder is actually in a supporting role to his friend, Rufus King. Now, Rufus King is a name you might recognize. He's one of the major, major, major American founders who is, no one knows his name. <laughs> At least Elbridge Jerry gets gerrymandering. Uh, Rufus King gets very little attention, um, despite doing many great things. And I'm not going to get off on a Rufus King rant. I could. But Rufus King was one of the inaugural senators representing the state of New York to the United States government. Shortly after he was a senator, he would eventually be sent as uh, to, to Europe as a minister to Great Britain. If I'm not mistaken, he's the one who... who uh, takes over for John Adams as minister to Great Britain. Someone else might have been in the middle there. Was it Timothy? No. There might have been someone. But either way, uh, he goes there for a very long time, several years. In all, between the United States Senate and minister to Great Britain, Rufus King uh, is away for 15 years. And he entrusts his in all of his affairs to his friend, Nicholas Lowe. And this is significant because just being out of the city going to philadelphia is so far removed at the time from your affairs you only got letters and then to go across the ocean where all you have are letters home that to actually have someone operating your business that you could trust is extraordinarily important and this helped us get through some very trying times with great britain thanks to i uh, nicholas lowe giving rufus king the opportunity to do so 
Um, and I, I also want to note, kind of on a more personal level, uh, you know, for viewers of the show, you might understand I live in upstate New York, and while I don't live specifically here, um, Nicholas Lowe invested a lot in land. And interestingly, there was a lot of people investing in land all over the place, including upstate New York, and speculation market plummeted at certain points. Uh, first of all, Lowe took advantage of some of the speculators being hurt and bought their land. Um, but he also, most speculators would buy land in massive amounts of acres and then sell them off in giant lots to other people. Lowe actually bought land and then developed it. This includes the uh, city of Watertown, which is a small city on the Canadian border up uh, at the uh, northeastern tip of the Great Lakes, uh, which, you know, might not be the most major city nowadays, but it was very important, especially uh, during the early years when the St. Lawrence River was a major trade route. Um, he helped develop Watertown. There's a town called Lowville. Uh, which you no one knows unless you live in upstate New York, but that bears his name. And there's a town called Boston Spa, not far outside Saratoga, which was, it's, an, it's actually a very nice little town. I drive through it most years. I go to Thanksgiving in Lake George, not this year, uh, staying at home this year. But uh, yeah, I drive through it. It's a nice little town, and uh, it's always been a fairly wealthy, nice little town. Uh, and he uh, was very involved in developing that. So that is the Lowe Brothers of New York City. Uh, one was a leading patriot and then a loyalist, and the other one was neither, no thank you. <laughs> so we're gonna get into James Monroe and George Washington right now. I'm gonna take a quick sip of my water because of all the speaking I'm doing. Thank you for your understanding. Let's talk, and I just realized I was supposed to be pulling these up the whole time. So that's Uriah Tracy that we spoke about. He's the one who wrote his Scipio, uh, signature of Scipio, who, uh, in reference to what we're about to talk about, uh, that was the Anti-Federalist. That's Isaac Lowe. He was a patriot and then turned loyalist. Uh, I assume that's his loyalist face because he looks like an angry person there. And this is Brother Nicholas Lowe. What a nice gentleman staying out of the politics. Now we're going to talk about James Monroe for a second. So I apologize. I forgot. Mostly apologize to myself because it takes me, uh, you know, a little bit of time to set that up beforehand. <laughs> I feel like an idiot. Anyway... Um, James Monroe was a name you know. He ends up being president of the United States. Before he was president of the United States, he fought in the American Revolution, made his way up in Virginia politics, was a candidate for uh, United States House of Representatives. He lost that race actually to James Madison. Um, he ends up becoming a United States Senator. And while he's in the United States Senate, he talks a lot of trash about the George Washington administration. He talks, it's a bad pick. Oh yeah, gross, I know. Um... James Monroe is one of the most outspoken people against the George Washington administration. Believe it or not. And uh, granted at this time, no one's really bad-mouthing Washington. Uh, they're just, they're not even Democratic Republicans yet. It's not Federalist and Democratic Republicans. At this time, it's pro-administration and anti-administration. And that's the kind of the most negative thing you could say about someone when the administration you're against is George Washington, who you think his name looms large now, like he was a, a very commanding president back then. I mean, and when you're James Monroe, you had served under this man for several years during the war a decade earlier. But now he's a United States senator, and he's talking a lot of trash. But George Washington is trying to get things smoothed over with Great Britain. Because he's trying to smooth things over with Great Britain, France is unhappy. So what he does is he sends John Jay to England to negotiate a treaty that becomes the Jay Treaty. And he sends, again, someone who's very critical of his administration, which is not something Washington's necessarily accustomed to this early on, although it is the point where people start to, I don't want to say turn on Washington, but where it's like, okay, like we really disagree with what he's been doing for several years we're going to start talking about it now. Um, but because James Monroe disagrees with Washington in favor of France, that's why Washington chooses Monroe to be minister to France. And he sends Monroe to France as minister because he knows the French like Monroe because Monroe has been defending France publicly in the United States Senate, and the French know this. So he goes to France, and the French really like him. And then word comes around that the Jay Treaty got accepted. 
France is really unhappy about all this. Like, they really hate Britain. And this is, like, during the reign of terror, so, like, they're not messing around when, when I use the word hate. <laughs> like, they really hate these people. Um, and Monroe is there, and eventually, after less than two years there, he gets recalled by George Washington. And Washington actually says it's because... James Monroe uh, wasn't defending the Jay Treaty enough. And Monroe is like, but I hate the Jay Treaty. <laughs> like, I'm not going to lie about that. It's terrible. So, very shortly thereafter, he is, like I said, he is replaced. Monroe was very quickly recalled, replaced by uh, Charles Coatsworth Pinckney, who would soon run as a vice presidential candidate for John Adams. Interestingly enough, but he comes home and James Monroe does something very unique at the time. He publishes a paper criticizing George Washington. He calls it a view of the conduct of the executive. And he, uh, the, the long, the full title is a view of the conduct of the executive in the foreign affairs of the United States connected with the mission to the French Republic during the years 1794, 5, and six, a.k.a. a few of what George Washington was doing to me, James Ma M Monroe, while I was in France. And he just, just, I think the word you'd hear today is eviscerates George Washington for many of his policies. And he's like, I was trying my best to keep France on board. That's what I was sent there to do. You expect me to keep them on board by saying, hey, look at this great deal we just worked out with Great Britain that you hate. It's really great. We're doing a great job. He's like, I disagree with it for several reasons, and the French disagree with it for more reasons. Like, how how could I possibly have <laughs> like gotten any better? Um, now, as I said, uh, uh, can I even go back? Uh, there's a gentleman, uh, Uriah Tracy, that we talked about before. He publicly defends George Washington's decisions um, in, in his discussions of a view of the conduct of the executive under the pen name uh, uh, Scipio. But um, James, you know, and that's, and that's what publicly happens. And then it kind of fades away because some years go by and then eventually James Monroe becomes very important. A little important to Thomas Jefferson, real important to James Madison, and then the president during the era of good feelings. And what's super interesting about this whole thing, the reason I bring the whole thing up, and there's a link to it in uh, my article, I believe. I hope there's a link. Maybe not. I sure hope there is. Either way, I can send you a link if you want. Contact me. Um, uh, the really cool thing about all this is George Washington gets a copy of Monroe's view, view of the conduct of the executive, where Monroe is talking trash about Washington. And Washington actually goes through it line by line, writing down his response. Now, Washington's not the type of guy who would ever come out and say these things, especially by the time he gets it, John Adams is president. By the time it's published, Washington's in retirement back in Mount Vernon. He is done. So what is he doing in his retirement? He gets this, <laughs> this pamphlet, almost a book, almost, that... Uh, Monroe writes, and he writes in it, and you can go on Founders Online, I think there's a link in my article, I'm not seeing it right off the bat, but I, I can send it out. He starts writing about uh, uh, all this different stuff, um, line by line, rebutting James Monroe's criticisms of George Washington. And what's interesting is, first of all, Washington talks a little bit, it doesn't seem that Washington ever expected anyone to read this, at least not while he was alive. Um, and we only get it because it gets passed down to his um, nephew, Bush, Bushrod Washington, who would actually become a, chief, uh, a Supreme Court Associate Justice. But you could see Washington's temper coming out. He's, he's insulting the character of James Monroe, which is not something George Washington was supposed to ever do. Um, and he's actually rebutting the, every attack. And what's very interesting is he attacks... Monroe essentially makes it seem like Monroe is just being petty and angry that he was fired. When, like, truth be told, and, and maybe I'm biased, I guess, but truth be told, a lot of what Monroe writes makes a lot of sense. And a lot of what Washington writes is just kind of 
an angry rebuttal, like, no, you are, kind of, you know, I know you are, but what am I? You know, I know, and that's obviously a child misre childish misrepresentation of how Washington awards it. I do recommend you guys read through it. It's it's fascinating. I spent way too much time reading it in the last two weeks, um, and I was kind of led there from the other article. So um, I know there's things I'm leaving out, I'm sure, but definitely wanted to make sure you guys got that. And I'm going to remember to do this now when we move on to our next founder, James Caldwell. And I need to give a shout out to viewer uh, a pre Preacher's Day Off one of my viewers who uh, made this recommendation in the comments for James Caldwell. Uh, and this is, this is going to be a little sad. That was a little uh, intense argument between two presidents of the United States. This is a little bit of a sad story. So James Caldwell was born in Virginia, but he, he went to Princeton and studied to be a minister, a uh, preacher. And he takes up residence in Elizabethtown, New Jersey, and he is a preacher. And then the American Revolution breaks out. And in the build-up to the American Revolution, well, James Cald Caldwell is using his pulpit to promote the fight for freedom. And they do. So they start to fight for freedom. You may know. Uh, he becomes, Caldwell becomes a chaplain of a, one of the New Jersey militias under Elias Dayton. One of, one of the most important, I believe he becomes a brigadier general, definitely a colonel. The most important colonels in the New Jersey militia, Elias Dayton. Uh, and while he's serving there, he's also doing all the preacher things. He's helping to uh, people who are hurt best he can. He's giving spiritual guidance. And then he becomes quartermaster of the same regiment. So this group of guys, a regiment is usually about a thousand people. So he's got about a thousand people that he is not only the spiritual leader for, but actually the one getting them food and clothing as a job, not just as, you know, you might assume a, uh, a preacher might be doing it uh, through the church and religious for uh, religious and spiritual reasons. No, no, he was doing it because that's what they actually needed him to do. Um, so he goes on and uh, yeah, I see you, Alexander. Yeah, they, it's, it's, yes, <laughs> it continues. Uh, uh, but that, that was something that had to be done, especially back then. You know, preachers were in many places more than just spiritual leaders. They were town leaders, leaders of society, and in this case, an actual quartermaster. Now, during a battle known as the Battle of Connecticut Farms, and what I'm about to tell you is a little bit hearsay, I'll try and be as factual as possible, but uh, there was a battle and the British start leaving. They are retreating from the Battle of Connecticut Farms in New Jersey. Now, by this point, James Caldwell's house and church had been burned by the British because his sentiments were known. So they had left and his, his wife and children were in a house by the Battle of Connecticut Farms. Again, it's in New Jersey, but it was settled. I've read into it a little bit. Connecticut Farms was settled by people from Connecticut who moved to New Jersey and named it Connecticut Farms just to make things tough. Uh, but as the British are retreating from Connecticut Farms, they shoot through the window and kill Hannah, James Caldwell's wife. Now, again, historically, um, she was killed on purpose as a revenge for Caldwell being a patriot. That seems a little much. I don't really know of, especially British regulars, shooting at women intentionally through the window of a house. Um, even if it was loyalists, uh, oh, I'm sorry, yes, I do say here, it was Loyalist, uh, and it's, you know, the story, that's right, I'm sorry, out of the corner of my eye, I'm remembering. As the story goes, it was a Loyalist who lived in the area and knew the Caldwells and shot through the window to kill this woman in front of her kids. Is that what happened, or was it a stray bullet that maybe got her? I don't know. Truthfully, truthfully, women and children would not have necessarily been that close to the battle, um, sometimes people did watch battles from the hillside, and that practice continued through the Civil War. Women and children and families would come watch for the day because they didn't have movies, so they'd watch battles. Um, but it seems, the story goes, and it does seem fairly likely that a loyalist did see Hannah Caldwell through the window and specifically shoot at her. Super sad. James Caldwell is sad. And two weeks later, he is back at the Battle of Springfield fighting with the Patriots. Because he could be as sad as he wants to. Now he's lost 
Some things that are very, you know, at this point he's lost his house, his church, and his wife. Why stop fighting now? He goes, he, he performs bravely in the Battle of Springfield. Uh, and the Battle of Springfield ends up essentially being the last major battle in the northern part of the American Revolutionary War. And things move south. Now Caldwell stays in New Jersey, but a year goes by and then there's a victory at Yorktown. And then a month later, uh, he is returning, James Caldwell is returning to Elizabethtown, New Jersey. Now there are patriots on guard, but there's a little bit of a confrontation. He rides in to Elizabethtown, where he's from, and there is someone there who's not from Elizabethtown, uh, a, a sentry, so to speak, a patriot who's guarding the town. And he, the, the person guarding the town orders James Caldwell to stop. Caldwell stops. And apparently this gentleman asked to search his bag. For whatever reason, Caldwell said, no, you can't search my bag. Now, where was he... How polite was the first guy being to Caldwell? How polite was Caldwell being to the guy? I don't know. But what I do know is this gentleman, James Morgan, decided things were too tense and he shot and killed James Caldwell, the preacher of the town. Now, this was a terrible idea because Morgan was immediately tried and convicted of murder because that's what he did. No matter how things went down, uh, this there was clearly no reason to kill him because it's not even like he was tried for some military crime or, you know, within the military. No, he was tried by the town and convicted of murder. And just two months later, was hung publicly for his crime. It's a sad story, uh, a very interesting one. And I'm surprised I never actually heard of it before. Uh, so I do, again, want to thank uh, Mr. Preacher's Day Off for recommending that I look into it. Uh, because, you know, just because it's not a happy story doesn't mean it's not an interesting and fun story and an important one. And I do want to end this particular story. We have one more story left, but I do want to end this particular story by talking about... Um, so because of this, Caldwell's children were orphaned. And they were taken up by friends and family who organized a, um, uh, yeah, Troy, I agree. It's a really fascinating story. Uh, but the children were, were taken in by the community and helped raised by the community. And many people donated, including George Washington himself donated to the relief of these children. And Washington donated a hundred dollars, which doesn't sound like a lot now, but then was a substantial sum, uh, you know, not. Uh, I wouldn't know exactly how to compare it, but I, I wouldn't say it was like probably like a few months worth of your average salary, maybe not a whole year. It's not like we're talking about a lifetime's worth of money, but a good chunk of money to help support these kids because even Washington was like, that's really messed up. <laughs> like We cannot let this slide. Um, so even though I just told a story talking a little bit of trash about George Washington, I'm happy that now I can also be like, you know, Washington did some good stuff. Uh, and we're going to move on to today's last and final founder. I'm going to take one more sip of water. I apologize. You heard me sniff a little bit. It's cold enough out where we have to start the fire in the fireplace, but not cold enough where we remember to put water on top because the, the water in the air keeps it warm. But it's not that cold, but it's also because of that dries it out. And now I get the sniffles. I don't know how science works. I'm here for history. <laughs> anyway, enough about me. I have sacrificed a lot. Thanks, Alexander. No, I know, I know. They did sacrifice a lot. I agree with you. I'm just being silly. Um, and we're going to talk about one last person, and that's Elijah Payne, who I kind of stumbled onto at random this week, looking into, like, electric cars. Okay, quick side note. Um, uh, uh, Davenport, someone, I forget the first name, but Davenport, there's a person in 1830s, born during the Jefferson administration, Thomas Jefferson administration, um... I'm going to look it up. Davenport Electric Car. It was Thomas Davenport. I'm going to give you a bonus founder right now because it's a little bit too late to be a founder. Born during, in 1802 during the Thomas Jefferson administration, there was a person named Thomas Davenport born in Vermont. And Davenport would be the first person in the world, well, yes, the first person in the world to build a working car. 
Uh, he built an electric car because electric motors had just been invented in Europe. Somehow in Vermont, he got a hold of this in 1836 and actually patented his electric motor in the United States. And he was able to build an electric car in 1836. That's almost 200 years ago and like 80 something years before Henry Ford makes him popular. It didn't work very well. It could only go a little bit <laughs> and stop, but he did build it. Okay, that's your bonus founder. Uh, and I bring it up because somehow I stumbled onto that when I was like trying to not research the American Revolution for 10 minutes. And through that, I stumbled onto Elijah Payne because they both lived in the same town at different times. <laughs> so Elijah Payne is a very interesting person. Uh, much like Uriah Tracy from Connecticut, uh, uh, Yes, from Connecticut, uh, and 19 years old, joined the Continental Army, just at the same time. Much like Tracy, he only spent a few, two or three years in the Continental Army before he went to college. But unlike Tracy, he went to Yale. Uh, this gentleman, Elijah Payne, went to uh, Harvard. Studies at Harvard, yada, 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 gets a law degree, moves to Vermont. And at this time, Vermont was not yet a state, it was... Technically, its own independent nation. It had declared independence from absolutely everyone, and it was recognized by absolutely no one. But it would be a state, and people saw that coming in. And uh, um, Elijah Payne moves there, becomes a leading lawyer, and ends up starting several mills, um, a cloth factory. Uh, it just becomes a general leader of young Vermont. Eventually, he goes to its House of Representatives and is elected to a seat on Vermont's Supreme Court. And he's serving there as a Supreme Court Justice for Vermont when in 1795 he is elected as a United States Senator. And he goes for six years, end of the Washington administration. Uh, uh, he's there at the same time again as Uriah Tracy. Uh, Uriah Tracy is more of a leader. Uh, Elijah Payne plays more of a backup role in the Senate. Until seven, uh, uh, 1801, he is re-elected to be a Senator, but he doesn't serve. Instead, he resigns because he was chosen by John Adams to be a judge, not just any judge, a federal judge, in the district of Vermont. Then there weren't so many judges, and Vermont was a new state. It was a very small state. It got one judge for the whole state. And he's not just any judge. He is appointed as one of John Adams' famous midnight judges. And, you know, I don't talk about the midnight judges a ton, but just as a reminder... You know, John Adams' last two months, and even up to his last day, John, uh, he was... Okay, that's all right. Thanks thanks for coming, Miss Fitter. We appreciate you just popping in either way. Uh, we're wrapping up here with John Adams appointing midnight judges. And what happened was, well, John Adams was a Federalist, and Thomas Jefferson was going to take over as a Democratic-Republican. So in, just before they got booted out of office, John Ad Federalist President John Adams and the Federalist uh, United States Congress passed a bunch of judges right at the last minute just to get them in under the line before Jefferson took over so the Federalists could stick around for at least a little while. And John Adams, uh, I'm sorry, Elijah Payne ex resigns from the Senate. This is how important that the midnight judges were to the people at the time, is a gentleman would resign from the Senate to take up a position as a judge just to keep the Democratic Republicans out of it. Now, as I had said... Uh, Elijah Payne had been a, a, a justice on the Vermont State Supreme Court already and now as a federal judge in that court it was almost kind of like a, a raise and he could also go home not a lot of people necessarily wanted to hang out in Washington D.C. at the time because it was a muddy swamp with very little buildings they had just cleared some land and built some buildings <laughs> but no one really lived there yet so people didn't really want to hang out um, but furthermore it was just that important that the midnight judges be appointed that federalists be given these judgeships throughout whatever happened with Thomas Jefferson and future administration. And the last thing I do want to note about Elijah Payne is his son. You know, the, the founders were not just the founding fathers of the United States. They were literal fathers, many of them, and their children did many great things. And especially, as I said, Elijah Payne was there leading Vermont before Vermont was even a state wasn't even recognized by New York. It wasn't even recognized as a territory by the United States for a while. It was just 
nothing. <laughs> and, but they considered themselves something. They thought they were an independent nation. And I'm not trying to... If you're from Vermont, I apologize. You were an independent nation. I'll give it to you. Um, but his son actually ends up uh, being... Oh, you know what? Before I talk about his son, I just want to say... Elijah Payne, when he became a federal judge, was in his early 40s. And he would hold that position for 41 more years. Another half of his life. He'd live into his 80s. So we're talking about Jefferson, Madison, Monroe, John Quincy Adams, Andrew Jackson, Martin Van Buren, uh, 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 and the guy after Van Buren. Dies quick, Harrison, and then, what is it, Tipping Newton, Tyler too. So all the way to President Tyler, he is still in the seat. That's why it was so important for John Adams to sneak these judges in. Um, during this time, his son, uh, Charles Payne, ends up becoming known as kind of the father of the Vermont Railroads. He starts the Central, uh, Vermont Central Railroad. He either start or maybe it was the Central Vermont Railroad. Either way, the name switches at one point. Same thing. He starts the Vermont Central Railroad and brings trains to Vermont. It becomes important enough that he actually becomes governor of Vermont for, for uh, I think it was two years. And luckily for his father, he lives long enough to see his son become governor of Vermont. So, a little bit extra bonus there. So that is... That's this week, Founders. Thank you so much for coming. You guys were commenting a lot more than usual on uh, Wednesday chats, but that's fine. Um, Alexander, it's amazing how many Founders and Movers and Shakers had education in law or were just good orders. Yeah, uh, I agree. Uh, especially many of the people we actually cover or, or that we know that made the Continental Congress, a lot of them were lawyers because those who, the people who know the law are the ones who best make the laws. Um, and that's why law was and I guess is so appealing at the time, especially when there was a lot of constitution building. And you could see why a young lawyer would want to go to Vermont when it was just being built. And you have the opportunity to help build this nation or that state, I should say, or considered itself a nation. Um, and as far as orders, yeah, being able to speak publicly was huge. I mean, some of these people would get up on stage and just speak for hours and hours I mean, and he, you know, here I am struggling to get through an hour, and I like wrote all this this week and did all this research this week, and reread the article right before I hit play, and I'm still like forgetting things. <laughs> you know? Like, I can't imagine some of it. I can't. Uh, it's a great point, Alexander. Thank you so much for bringing it up. Uh, before we go, like I said, I am going to have trivia again on Friday, even though it's a holiday weekend. So if you can join us, come on. I'm not sure what the prize is going to be yet. Uh, I am getting the the other prizes are going out this week. Or, or did go out this week. They might still be a little behind, but I don't know what's going on with the post office with, you know, holidays and Black Friday coming up and all that. Um, if you guys have any questions or comments, I'm always here. Um, you can follow me here. You could do it on uh, uh, Facebook, Twitter, YouTube. YouTube is here. Uh, my email address is all down the link below. Um so thank you so much. Thank you so much, Troy. Uh, and I want to give out a, sh a big shout out to Troy, actually, uh, who is one of the Patriots who supports this channel on Patreon and makes everything here possible uh, and actually raised his payment this week. So thank you so much, Troy. I can't tell you how much I appreciate all the help all the Patriots over there give me. So if you guys want to consider supporting the channel, would really appreciate it. You know, I'm always trying to invest in the channel, everything that comes in. I keep I'm pointing at the microphone and the camera and... and you know, and the time. I put a lot of time into it. <laughs> I'm still trying to figure out exactly how color works right, and uh, I'm still, like, trying out new programs over here. Um, I can't wait to start doing interviews again. I'm just having so much problems with the sound. Every time I do a practice one, I get this echo I can't get rid of. I'm trying another one this weekend. So cross my fingers. Hope it works. Um, not complaining. Just letting you know why it's been two and a half months since I've had an interview. Can't wait to get the interviews back because there are a bunch of people I'm in contact with who I think you'd be very excited to hear from. So thank you again. Happy Thanksgiving, everyone. Um, happy Black Friday, I guess. <laughs> uh, like I said, if there's any questions you guys want, uh, if you have any founders you want me to talk more about, let me know. Even if it's someone I've done before, I could probably find more to talk about. Uh, I'll probably write an article and then talk about them. Uh, but uh, like I said, Preacher's Day Off, Made a recommendation, James Caldwell. It was a great story I'd never actually heard before. 
I'd love to just learn about people I've never heard before. I like to research super round, random people like Elijah Payne. Um, and I also like to learn more about the big names. Like, I'm here talking about Rufus King real quick, and I'm like, I gotta talk more about Rufus King. He's a really important guy, and we just... It's, it's a name that people just generally don't know at all. Um, despite... Being everywhere. <laughs> like, I don't know what to tell you. Um, so I'm going to end it on that. We're like right about an hour. Oh, right now. I got to go real quick before I, and it's an hour and one minute. I didn't make it. Man, I wish I had looked up a second earlier. But uh, I do want to say thank you guys. Happy Thanksgiving. I hope you and your families have a great everything. Um, if you want to do me a favor and hit like on your way out, that is the greatest thing you can do because the more people that hit like, the more people see the channel, the bigger our community gets, the more fun we have, and the more we can all learn together about the American Revolution. So thank you so much for watching. Uh, again, happy Thanksgiving. And I'm going to end with our traditional ending. Many of you might not understand what it is, but I'll explain it again next week. I will see you tomorrow with another founder. Friday for trivia, next week for another round of Week in Review, and round.